What a wonderful. What a wonderful morning for this congregation to welcome Rick and to know already how benefited we will be by his presence in, in our midst. Um, Rick and I now become the bookends of the clergy and residence because he's the youngest and I'm the oldest. And um, uh, those who are at my end of the bookends welcome his fresh new insights and his his ability to analyze and articulate views of what the church is meant to be that we need to hear. So we are blessed to have you, Rick. And I say that to you personally, and I say that knowing that I speak for the congregation as a whole. If I were to give a title to um, today's sermon, it would be an alternative view. And I have to tell you that um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about um, how to say what I want to say today. Um, it's been a difficult uh, preparation for me because um, as is often the case for me, I have more to say than there's time to say it in. And um, uh, what I have to say today is particularly problematic because it's going to occasion a lot of thought on people's parts in terms of their traditional way of looking at faith, their traditional way of looking at the church, but more specifically, their traditional way of looking at their concepts of God. So I'm gonna remind us that we are a church who says to everyone, no matter who you are on your life's journey, you are welcome here, believers, doubters, seekers, and those who question are all welcome in our community of faith. I need that reminder put out in front of you before I even begin to speak because I think that um, some may identify me with the doubters and with the questioners and with the seekers more than they identify me with the believers. But that's because we have preconceived notions of what constitutes proper belief, and it's that I want to uh, address today. And very specifically, I want to address our view of Jesus and Jesus' relationship to God. And that is something that I think the church has in many ways distorted, and that for centuries has presented Jesus in such a way and God in such a way that people in now the second decade of the 22nd century are saying, I can't believe that anymore. And so I want you to hear a few um, scriptures that have informed me and what I have to say today. And they are taken from John and from Paul. And I want to remind you that John is writing at the beginning of the second century, and Paul is one of the earliest writings of the church, writing around the year 50, uh, some 20 years after the death of Jesus. I'm going to read scriptures that are familiar to you, but I want to read them with new interpretations. The first is going to be the prologue to the Gospel of John. And I want to remind you that in the Gospel of John that you're used to hearing, it begins, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. But I want to remind you that the Greek for the word, word, is logos. And logos can also mean reason or creative purpose. And I'm going to read the prologue to the Gospel of John with that other interpretation of the Greek term logos. So hear it as I read it with that interpretation of Logos. John begins his gospel with these words. In the beginning was the creative purpose. And the creative purpose was with God. And the creative purpose was God. 
This was what was in the beginning with God. And all things came into being through this creative purpose. And without it, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in this was life. And the life was the light of all humankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. And then later in his gospel, the 14th chapter as we would edit it, we find this scene where Jesus is talking to his disciples and specifically to Thomas and to Philip. As John would have it and records it, Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the God we call Father except through me. If you know me, you will know the one I call Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the God we call Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen this father. How can you say, show us the father? And then we turn to Paul, who was clearly the great theologian who moved the Jewish sect into a Gentile world. When he writes his second letter to the church at Corinth, and what we've edited as the fifth chapter, the 16th through the 21st verses, and Paul says this, from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now let those of us who have ears to hear the message in these scriptures, hear these messages and be benefited by these scriptures. Now, the problem is, I don't think the church has really heard the messages in these scriptures. I think the church has not been preaching, has not been teaching, has not been living out the radical new understanding of God and God's relationship to Jesus that these scriptures would have us know. H. Richard Niebuhr, the brother of Reinhold Niebuhr, teaching at Yale University, once said, the gospel is three words. God is love. 
And yet, the church throughout its history has held on to an archaic view of God who is a being that we approach with fear because he is there to judge us whenever we do anything wrong. And he is there to condemn us when we fail to be the way he, and it is masculine, wants us to be. So fear of the Lord rather than delight in God becomes the paradigm for what most Christians think their religion is all about. And I, from the time I was about 18 years old, struggled with what was the good news in that? What was the good news in having to live my life afraid that if I do something wrong, I might burn in a place called hell? What was the good news in, in a message that said, I was a worthless sinner? What was the good news in a message that said, there was nothing good about me, but in spite of how bad I was, this God who is a being up in heaven, sitting on a throne, judging the world, had decided because he's so loving to maybe spare me, but maybe not. Why is it that I had to go to bed saying, if I should die before I sleep, I pray the Lord my, Lord, my soul to keep, as if the chances were that even as a child, I may have done enough bad that I had to pray that my soul would be safe. These are the kinds of psychological, much less philosophical understandings of religion that I think has caused many people today to turn from the church. Why many churches that once had hundreds in their congregation only have 30 or 40. Why my church in Oklahoma that had 300 people in attendance every Sunday now has nine people attending worship there. William Hamilton once was speaking to a group of us at Southern Methodist University. And this is what uh, William Hamilton from Emory University had to say. As the historical world of Christendom sinks ever more deeply into the darkness of an irre ir irrecoverable past, Theology is faced with the choice either of relapsing into a dead and archaic language or of evolving a whole new form of speech. Quite simply, the radical Christian has judged theology as such to be close to either original thinking or imaginative vision. And the so-called renaissance of theology in the 20th century has done little to dispute that. The task of theology today is to appropriate a contemporary Christian vision in such a manner as to make it thinkable as faith. To the extent that theology even now remains bound to a primordial or transcendent word, it will remain closed to the present and human actuality of history. In short, what, what he is saying is that Christianity, as is presented to most people, is frankly irrelevant to their lives. They may attend services still, but what they hear there is something they set aside in order to get on with the reality of who they are, how they live, and the context in which they live that out. And incidentally, it was not, it was, it was Altizer who was speaking to us, Thomas Altizer at the time. Now, I think that if we reclaim, and those of us who are in progressive Christianity need to be the ones who reclaim it, if we reclaim this new understanding, which is actually the old understanding of what Christian faith is all about, then we will be in a position to do the creative thinking and the creative visioning of what Christianity is supposed to be. And I think that is grounded in our understanding of incarnation. We have spent so many centuries 
because the church has power and because the church wanted its power to determine what people believed and the church had the power to keep people from questioning and the church had power to threaten people if they didn't believe what the church wanted them to believe. We have now the opportunity to reframe the, Christ, the Christian perspective in such a way that the church becomes relevant to life again and faithful to its scriptural history. And those are the two things that theology must do. Be faithful to the message and be relevant to the context. Our context is the 21st century. The scriptures context is the first century. To remain faithful to that scripture and relevant to our time, we have to hear the message with ears to hear with. We have to see the truth with eyes to see with. And I suggest to those of us who are the seekers and those of us who are the questioners, an alternative view of this that I think is firmly grounded in scripture and firmly grounded in our understanding of incarnation. And as radical as it may seem, because we spent so much time talking about how Jesus became divine, we've missed the fact that at the essence of the Christian gospel is the statement that our old concepts of God have been set aside and frankly identified with Jesus and died with Jesus on the cross. There are old concepts of God as a being out there instead of God as the ground of being in which we live and move and have our being has been set aside by the incarnational understanding that the message is not so much about the human becoming divine, but the divine becoming human. Is that not what Emmanuel is? God with us, God in the flesh, fully human. Remember, our concepts of God are just our concepts. It's not the reality of God. The reality of God is the great mystery, the great source of all that is, that all that was, that of all that ever will be. We will never know God. We've known that since Immanuel Kant in 1799. We have to move from an objective understanding of God to a subjective experiencing of God and understand that Christian faith has to do with the internal experience of that each one of us in our precious uniqueness experiences as God without having some preconceived notion of a concept of God imposed upon us so that someone's concept of God has to become our experience. Two things come to my mind when I talk this way. One is remembering a lecture um, by a psychologist who was talking about the objective and, and the subjective. And he was warning us about going into the counseling room with all of our psychotherapeutic theories and imposing our theories on the person we were seeing rather than standing under, understanding that person and allowing their experience to be the guide for us so that we did not superimpose a preconceived notion on them, but were responsive to the experience that was them. That's a very important difference. The church has been superimposing preconceived concepts and saying, if you don't believe that, then you're wrong. And of course, if you're wrong in the church, then you're damned. And so whole congregations stand up and do the credos. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of earth. And everyone has to say the same words at the same time in the same voice. As if everyone believes the same thing and their own unique individual experiences do not matter anymore. You know, I had an experience in an Episcopal church not long ago where I actually could not say the words I was supposed to say. And the words were, I am as a worm unworthy to eat even the crumbs from your table. 
those words just would not come out of my mouth because that preconceived notion of my humanity was so offensive to me that had I not been in that church for a very special reason, I probably would have gotten up and walked out. And yet that's what the church has done. Objectified God with certain con conceived ideas of what that God is, a lot, is like, as if God is an object out there, and then subjected ourselves to that preconceived notion of what that God's will for us is as opposed to moving from the human to the divine and saying, this is what my experience of the divine is. I'm not questioning the reality of the divine. I'm saying we need to listen to one another's experience of the divine. And that's what Schleiermacher was about. Now we'll get into 19th century theology, but that's what, that's what the, the change in, in theology was back then, but we've lost it again. We've lost it again, and we're back to superimposing dogmas and su superimposing doctrines, and now we don't see the individual anymore. That's what, that's what Rollo May, the psychologist I was referring to, was talking about, that we don't even see the client in front of us. We've got a theory in our mind, and so they're just a group of neuroses in front of us, and not a person who's precious and unique and has their own life experiences that we need to understand. And so it is with the church. And so let's listen to our scriptures. And what do the scriptures say? What is Jesus saying? Saying, if you want to find God, if you want to see God, look at the person in front of you. When you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Why are you looking for God? What is Jesus saying? The kingdom of God is within you. What is Paul saying? All this is so that we become the righteousness of God. We become the righteousness of God. And what does that do? It obliterates the distinction between God and humanity. It, that's what incarnation is about. What does it do? It obliterates the difference between the sacred and the profane. It obliterates the difference between the flesh and the spirit. It obliterates the difference between me and my neighbor. Because I'm not good and the neighbor is bad. I'm not right and the neighbor is wrong. We're two human beings trying to live our unique lives, trying to find meaning. And in that search for meaning, we may formulate our, con our concepts of God in the sure knowledge that we do not know and can never know the reality of God. But what we trust is that we live and move and have our being in that reality of which we are a part, in which we live, and which, as Jesus would say, lives in us. The kingdom of God is within you. And until the church opens its doors, as our church tries to do, to all the questioners, all the seekers, all the doubters who are really seeking truth and meaning for their lives and who are not finding that answer, not finding that meaning, not finding a sense of fulfillment or meaningfulness in what the traditional church has always presented. Until we offer them the opportunity to be themselves openly, honestly, authentically, without fear, without facade, without hesitation, so that they can bring their questions to us rather than memorize our answers for them the church will continue to sink more and more into irrelevancy for a generation of thinkers and seekers who are not going to find what they seek in a church that still presents ideas that are little more than old Greek and Roman mythology. So let us own who we are. Let us own what it means to be the progressive church that we are. Let us own our own openness to possibility and our own patience with the process of learning what can be more and more meaningful. And the sure knowledge that what we find meaningful today may have to be revised tomorrow. 
in the sure knowledge that any answer we give today is a tentative answer for meaningfulness in the now. And with new experiences, new understandings, new opportunities for dialogue, new opportunities for sharing insights with one another in a community that is beloved and accepting, we can find a truth. But one thing seems clear to me, and that is that Jesus' message was, if you want to find God, remember two things. The kingdom of God is within you, and you will see God in your neighbor as you have seen God in me. That is why I think John writes his letter and says, those who live in love, not with love, those who live in love, live in God, and God lives in them. Lives in them. The old distinctions are gone. This is new wine for new wineskins. Behold, the new has come, the old has passed away, all things are made new. I told you, I'm not sure about all this, but I felt with this community of faith, I just needed to share it out loud to see what we might do with it. Thank you for listening. Know how tentative it is. Just my thoughts. But I think there's some scriptural basis for what I'm trying to share. Maybe so. Now, what does this lead to? Well, in our service of worship, it leads to communion. And what is communion? We come with the bread. We come with the cup to a table, in this case, a virtual table, to whom all are welcome. Those seekers, those questioners, those doubters, all are welcome. And what do we say? We're here to remember. And what are we here to remember? The life, the ministry, the death, the faithfulness of Jesus of Nazareth. And what did he have to say? He turned to his disciples and he said, at this Passover table. Here's the bread. This is the bread that we have. When we've passed from bondage into freedom, that's what the Passover meal is about. We've gone from bondage to freedom. In our case, we're going from bondage to old ideas and concepts to the freedom to think anew and to visualize creatively something that's more relevant to our lives and yet faithful to our cause. So take this bread and eat it. Think of this bread as my body. For as I am, I want you to be. Take me into you. And each time you eat it, remember what I've been all about. And here's this cup. I want you to all drink from it. For in this cup of wine that has been poured out is the wine of life. And I want you to live it. And when you drink of it, be at one with me. With my new vision of God, my new vision of life, my new vision of what it is to love one another without distinction. 
So let us now as a community remember these things. As we take the bread and eat it together. And if you take the cup and virtually take it together in thanksgiving for what the life of Jesus of Nazareth continues to mean even here, even now. Amen. Let us hear a closing hymn. 